Back on the surface, Choppy sees greet Alvin. And there's yet another problem. Are you going to cut the cutters in with a hydraulic, or would you like us to cut it with a uh, cutters, or can you put some tether up? Get the vehicle floating. Get the vehicle floating now. Pounding waves have torn JJ from its cage on the front of Alvin. Unless divers can secure the little robot, JJ may be damaged or even lost. Divers have cut the tether which connects JJ to Alvin, and the robot has been hauled aboard the rescue inflatable. Meanwhile, the mother submarine is winched aboard Atlantis II. Alvin weighs 18 tons. Retrieval under these conditions can be tricky. are still intact, glass. And so you, you'd lose dimension when you came up to the side of the, of the hull, but as you got up to the top, you'd start being able to feel, yeah, a person could have walked there, or, or uh, that's where a lifeboat could have been. And you'd start to get more and more dimension as time went on. It felt good that, that you would bring back a record that would be fascinating, but would, if anything, put an end to any thoughts of salvage. It's not salvageable ship is broken up uh, and it's buried into the bottom and you couldn't get it out. So that's sort of nice. We're going back tomorrow. We can fix all the things that went wrong today. We'll go back tomorrow and uh, get this little robot out. And he located a handful of secure landing sites aboard Titanic. One of these sites is the bridge area where there used to be a wheelhouse. 74 years later, it's gone. Only the bronze helm remains. It's JJ's job to take a closer look. We've got a lot of dust. It's, it's going to be a... We've got to pump JJ's stroke. Yeah. 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 That's the uh, steering wheel. Sure. center line of the ship is right over to your left. Another landing site for Alvin lies on the starboard upper boat deck. Here were some of the ship's 20 lifeboats. Lifeboats which had room for barely half the liner's 2,200 passengers and crew. Still on the upper boat deck, JJ peers through the open window of a seaward-facing cabin, one of the most sought after. side of the ship, JJ at last finds an opportunity to swim inside the hull. Here, first-class passengers had their own promenade deck. Right up here. Right there. Come on, read that. Try not 
to hit the ceiling. JJ finds one of the davits which held Titanic's lifeboats. Unlike the wooden portions of the ship, parts of the machinery have been barely affected by 74 years on the seabed. No, these brass. Rise back up along that edge. That's it. Just keep coming in. Go down now. Here, just after the ship's bridge, lived the Titanic's senior officers. Only four survived. Climax of Ballard's dives on Titanic was JJ's entry into a gaping hole on the upper deck between the funnels. This used to be the entrance to the ship's grand staircase and was covered with a glass dome. For years, Ballard has dreamed of JJ swimming down the grand staircase, flanked by the best of Edwardian taste and decor. Only now will he discover just how much of the ship's elegant interior has survived. Steep drop off, and it's all, yeah, that's it. As JJ sinks deck by deck deeper into Titanic, it becomes very clear that the interior of the ship is unrecognizable. Everything wooden has been eaten by wood-boring marine organisms. The stucco plaster and the rich carpets have long gone. Even the metal is beginning to disintegrate, producing these hanging fingers of corroded steel. Ballard christens them rusticles. Occasionally, though, as a reminder of the way she once was, Titanic produces objects like this, a light fitting, once suspended from the ceiling of the lavish first-class public rooms.
went to the moon, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Went dancing in the ballroom. We went dancing dance in the ballroom. Oh, God, that was you not... Been just... <laughs> oh. We had a chandelier <laughs> right on. You hit this, you hit the cranes, right. you hit the massive well, obviously stuff. Obviously, I want to hit the wine balls. You'll With his dives on the bow section of Titanic complete, Ballard turns to the debris from the wreck which litters the seabed. Data from the nightly Angus runs have given Al Uchupi, the expedition's archivist, specific targets for Alvin and JJ. That's way down here. You see that one? ABC, so south. this is World News Tonight with Peter Jennings. Good evening. We're going to talk to the man who's been leading the Titanic expedition. Dr. Ballard, Peter Jennings from ABC News. You've now been down five times. Have you found any sign of the passengers who were on board? Well, I'm satisfied that we're not going to find any human remains on the ship itself. But we have yet to go down to the area of the debris field in the stern section. And that is where most of the people were when the ship sank. So uh, we'll be going down there tomorrow, but uh, I'm fairly confident that we won't find any remains and we'll just have to see. Any of these objects retrieved from the seabed would fetch a fortune at auction. But who actually owns Titanic? The White Star Line was reimbursed. The insurance company didn't carry it on their books. They wrote it off. And we're not trying to salvage it, so we're not salvagers. So nobody does, which is sort of spooky in the sense that it was safe up until now. Is it now safe? Few men will ever get the chance to retrieve any of these objects. One of them is Bob Ballard. Is he tempted to bring back the odd souvenir? It's sort of like opening Pandora's box. Uh, once you do it, it's done. Once you begin, where do you stop? I've been, I mean, I'm a collector of wires. I would love nothing better than to have a wine bottle from the Titanic, but I, th I think I'm not going to do it. We're going to see. <laughs> the expedition found three safes on the seabed. This is one of them. From the debris field, Alvin heads south to Titanic's stern section. The distance between the bow and the stern has by now convinced Ballard that the ship broke up on the surface and not on impact with the seabed as some have previously suspected. Unlike the bow, the stern is barely recognizable, twisted into grotesque shapes by the great ship's dying plunge. by now to really put together a fairly clear picture of several of the controversial issues that uh, are associated with the Titanic sinking. Certainly, the one that they always refer to is the gash. 
the 300-foot gash in the starboard side of the ship. Well, we drove along the entire length of the uh, bow section and only uh, lost it or didn't see it in the very uh, first 50 feet. Uh, what you see is the uh, a buckling of plating, a popping of rivets, creation of very small cracks where water could get in, and there is uh, damage along a, a, a significant portion of that starboard uh, hull, but there is not a ripped open hole. In all, Ballard and his team have shot hours of video and thousands of stills of Titanic, enough certainly to offer a poignant new account of the great liner's final hours. April 14th, 1912. It was a clear, calm night. Colder than usual, with the smell of ice in the air. At 11.39, from his perch in the crow's nest, lookout Frederick Fleet spotted an iceberg dead ahead. He telephoned the bridge. For a moment, nothing happened. Then, an officer on the bridge acknowledged his warning with a polite, thank you. Most passengers and crewmen were in their cabins. One of them was storekeeper Frank Prentice. I was talking to a pal of mine. He was sitting on my bunk. All of a sudden, she came to a halt. There was no fuss. It was like putting your brakes on a car and you gradually came to a halt. And I went for it on the uh, promenade deck and I looked down. I couldn't see any, any damage at all above the waterline. But what I did see was ice in the well deck, the forward well deck. And I thought, hello, we've hit an iceberg. At 12.05, Captain Smith ordered the ship's lifeboats to be uncovered. The drop from the boat deck to the water was about between 70 and 80 feet and you could hardly see the water, and people didn't want to go. They, they got in their minds she was unsinkable. At 12.15, the radio operator began tapping out a distress call, the letters CQD, followed by the ship's call sign, MGY. Later, he was to try the brand new distress call, SOS. By then, the captain had ordered out lifeboats and women and children. Lower the lifeboats and stand by. That was the order. Stand by. Some women refused to leave their husbands. Mrs. Strauss, wife of American store tycoon Isidore Strauss, told her husband, we've been living together for many years. Wherever you go, I go. At 2.20 in the morning, the great liner tilted her stern towards the sky, broke in half, and began her final plunge towards oblivion. Then, as the ship tore herself apart inside, an unforgettable noise, impossible to describe. One survivor said, she went down with an awful grating, like a small boat running off a shingly beach. Titanic disappeared for more than 70 years. There's a big emptiness now that, that this 10 years of, of obsession and madness is almost done. But uh, to me, the expedition in an overall context is really putting the Titanic legend to rest. Uh, in a sense, uh, when we go home, it's the end of a long journey for both us and the ship as well.
Already there are men who plan further expeditions to Titanic. Perhaps some will try to raise her. But Bob Ballard's parting gesture was a plaque left on the great liner's deck, asking that Titanic be left in peace. It is a memorial to this period of time, to that mistake of arrogance. Uh, it's a whole bunch of things to all bundled up and now down at the bottom of the ocean. And that's uh, a very peaceful place, very quiet place. And it's, it's sitting upright on the bottom very nobly uh, and at rest. terrible things but in a way they're, they're no less terrible than a, than a jumbo jet crashing um, uh, people lose their lives uh, but at sea especially with Titanic um, the thing was rolled out if you like in slow motion everything that did go wrong or everything that could go wrong did go wrong and when it did go wrong uh, there was time for people to be at their best and for people to be at their worst and the whole thing really was in a way like a Greek tragedy On the 31st of May 1911, 100,000 people gathered to watch Titanic being launched. No ceremony, just running her down the slipway. The operation took just over 60 seconds, but in the process, a shipyard worker was pinned beneath the shorings. His death not recognized by any except the most superstitious as a premonition. No one is actually on record as saying God himself could not sink this ship but she was widely believed to be indestructible. The designers, Harlan and Wolf, the builders of the ship, uh, designed the ship in such a way that she would float with any two compartments flooded. They were anticipating collision damage, really. Um, they, she would float possibly even with four compartments flooded. Her other safety features included a double hull and four life-saving craft in excess of the then British Board of Trade regulations. All told, she carried 16 lifeboats and four collapsibles, enough for 1,200 people. There were more than 2,200 on board when she sailed for the United States. The captain of the Titanic was Edward John Smith, formerly master of the slightly smaller and less luxurious sister ship, the Olympic. Smith, then aged 60, had spent 43 years at sea and planned to retire following this maiden voyage. After sea trials, the Titanic set sail from Southampton on her maiden voyage at around one o'clock on the afternoon of April the 10th. First port of call was Cherbourg, and then to Cove, known as Queenstown at that time, to leave off passengers and take on more. At the dawn's light vessel outside Cove on the morning of April the 11th, she stopped to take on board the pilot who would guide the mighty ship to the harbor entrance. Because of the difficult navigation and the ship's size, drawing almost 35 feet of water, Titanic had to drop anchor off Roach's Point, two miles from land. Waiting at the pierhead near the railway station, known to the local people as Heartbreak Pier, were seven second-class and 113 third-class passengers and more than a thousand sacks of mail. After inspection by the port doctor and final farewells to relatives and friends on the quayside, the passengers boarded the tender for the 30-minute trip out to Titanic. Among those were Danny Buckley from Bally Desmond and bagpiper Eugene Daly, who played as he left shore. As the tender rounded the stern to come alongside the gangway door, Captain Smith stood on the bridge wing high above to peer down on his new charges. This was the last known photograph taken of him. According to the certificate of clearance completed by the emigration officer, there were 2,208 passengers and crew aboard Titanic. This figure has always been disputed, and the number now widely believed shows he was short in his calculations by 19. Along with the almost penniless emigrants were first-class passengers whose combined wealth in today's money was in excess of six billion pounds. At half past one, Titanic weighed her 15 and a half ton anchor, and by late afternoon, as she and most of her passengers had their last look at land as the southern coast slipped past, fastnet, mizzenhead, and out into the Atlantic for her intended destination, New York. 350 miles southeast of Newfoundland, an iceberg waited.
Friday, Saturday and Sunday, more than 1,500 miles now from Cove, according to individual whim, the days and evenings were passed on the promenade decks in reading and writing, attending concerts by the ship's eight-man orchestra, playing deck games and taking workouts in the gym, gambling with cards among friends, or simply luxuriating in the sheer timelessness of the journey. On that Sunday afternoon, passengers noticed a rapid drop in air temperature. They didn't know what was ahead, but Captain Smith did. Later that night, the sea was flat calm, the sky twinkling with stars. The ship was traveling at 22 and a half knots. Wireless operator Harold Bride, seen here, was sending messages from the passengers to their friends in the States. In the crow's nest, lookouts Fred Fleet and Reginald Lee huddled into overcoats. They'd been on duty since 10 o'clock. It was now approaching 20 minutes to midnight. Suddenly, Fleet rang the warning bell three times and grabbed the telephone. Yes, what do you see? Iceberg! Right ahead! Thank you. Hard to starboard. The ship's engines were thrown into reverse and the watertight doors below closed at the pull of a lever. With the ship's tiller hard to starboard, the bow began to turn to port, one compass point, then two, but it was too late. The iceberg, photographed here, rising 50 feet above sea level and calculated at weighing 500,000, touched a hole in the Titanic starboard side, pushing in the plates and springing the rivets. Surprisingly, relatively with Harland and Wolf's managing director, Thomas Andrews. How long have we? An hour and a half, possibly two. Not much longer. Uncover the boats. The lifeboats could accommodate 1,178. At best, 1,049 people would have to take their chances in the freezing sea. At five minutes to midnight, Captain Smith ordered the ship's wireless operators to send out a plea for help. At first, the old CQD letters, and then SOS, becoming the first ship to use the now familiar distress signal. 58 miles to the southeast, the Carpathia immediately altered course to go to her help. Later, the Titanic sent up white rockets at intervals of about five minutes to guide would-be rescuers to her position. Closer still to the Titanic was the Californian, stopped just 19 miles away to the northwest. Her officers saw the rockets, but assuming them to be just identification signals between two other vessels, and having tried without success to contact this unknown ship, the captain didn't come to Titanic's rescue. Californian's wireless operator had closed down his radio for the night just 10 minutes before Titanic struck the iceberg. <laughs> Meanwhile, on board the Titanic, ship's officers saw the masthead lights of a ship about five miles away, later thought to have been the Californian. Titanic tried, without success, to call the ship with a Morse lamp. The lifeboats took away or picked up 705 passengers and crew. The ship's orchestra played ragtime tunes, and then just before the end, they played not, as was commonly believed, nearer by God to thee, but an American Episcopal hymn, He Leadeth Me, to the tune Autumn. Two hours and 40 minutes after hitting the iceberg, the Titanic sank, taking with her Captain Smith. 1,521 others drowned or froze to death in the sea, including wireless operator Jack Phillips, who continued to send messages up to the last few minutes of the ship's life. 73 of the third-class passengers who had embarked at Cove also died that night. Slowly, she reared up on end, till at last, she was absolutely perpendicular. Then, quite quietly, but quicker and quicker, she seemed just to slide away under the surface and disappear. Among the survivors was the ship's owner, Bruce Ismay, who later came to live in Ireland, and Eugene Daly, who would claim $50 for the loss of his bagpipes. Another was Danny Buckley, home in Bally Desmond and County Cork, saying simply, Danny is saved. On the Carpathia, he wrote this letter home. Our ship, the Titanic, struck an iceberg at 2.22 a.m. I then went on deck and met a sailor who asked me help lower the boats. He said, take a chance yourself. I did. The officers came along and ordered us off the boat. 
A woman in the boat said, Day down there, you're somebody's child. She put a rug over me and the boat went out. So I was saved. The woman who saved him was Mrs. Madeline Astor, whose husband, the multimillionaire Colonel John Astor, died that night. When the ship's stern rose in her death throes, the giant boilers inside broke loose and smashed down through the bulkheads. The ship itself broke up as it plunged at 30 miles an hour to the seabed, more than two miles beneath the surface. This is our artist's impression of how she looks today. The stern lies about a mile from the bow section, thousands of tons of coal and wreckage littering the seafloor between. The wreck was found last year, 10 miles from her reported position. Her navigator had got his figures wrong. The body of Mr. Tyrrell Cavendish was among the 328 recovered from the sea after the sinking. This gold watch, a wedding present, was found in his pocket. So what happened that night? Did the Titanic know about the ice fields? Yes, she did. From nine o'clock that morning, she had received and acknowledged ice warnings from other ships. Captain Smith had moved the Titanic's course slightly southward, but maintained her high speed. Before her maiden voyage, it was found that if the ship was put on full rudder, the forward momentum would carry her half a mile before she began to turn. When the lookout saw the iceberg, it was half a mile ahead. Fate could not have measured it more finely. In the subsequent American and British inquiries, neither Captain Smith nor the White Star Line were found to be negligent but they did find that the captain was reckless and overconfident in view of the ice warning. The man whose reputation suffered most was Captain Stanley Lord, master of the Californian. He claimed right up to his death that another ship had been between him and the Titanic that night, but the inquiries refuted this. Heading the British inquiry, Lord Mersey said, When she first saw the rockets, the Californian could have pushed through the ice to open water without serious risk and so come to the assistance of the Titanic. Had she done so, she might have saved many, if not all, of the lives that were lost. Senator Alden Smith, heading the United States Senate inquiry, said, Captain Lord of the uh, Californian deluded himself about the presence of another ship between himself and the Titanic. There was no such ship. He bore a heavy responsibility. Ironically, at 5 to 11 that night, the Californian's wireless operator tried to warn the Titanic about the ice she had encountered. But, irritated by the interruption to the commercial messages he was sending for passengers, Titanic's operator said, Keep out, shut up, you're jamming my signal. According to the official findings, this is what happened. The Titanic struck the iceberg at 20 minutes to midnight. She had seen no other ship before the collision. At 25 past 12, members of the crew saw a vessel moving up in a northeasterly direction. This vessel got progressively nearer to the stricken Titanic. At half past midnight, the Titanic sent up white exploding rockets in an effort to get assistance. Then, with the other vessel only five or six miles away, she tried signaling her with a Morse lamp, but there was no response. At two o'clock in the morning, one hour and 35 minutes after this other ship had been spotted, she turned and headed off in a westerly or southwesterly direction, leaving the Titanic to her fate. The end for the great liner came just 20 minutes later, when she lifted her stern and plunged more than two miles to the ocean floor. It was believed by many people that the mystery ship was the Californian, which ignored the Titanic's calls for help. But was she the Californian? The Californian arrived at the ice field at 20 minutes past 10. Her master, Captain Lord, rather than risk trying to get through the ice in darkness, stopped engines to await first light. By 5 to 11, the currents had swung the Californian's bow around to the northeast, and she spotted a ship similar in size to herself, moving from the east about five miles away. 
35 minutes later, the newcomer had stopped. Captain Lord ordered his officers to notify him should this ship come any closer. It was now half past 11, and further south, the Titanic was 10 minutes away from the iceberg. At midnight, and again at a quarter past, the Californian tried to raise the silent stranger with a Morse lamp, but she ignored the signals. At a quarter to one in the morning, white rockets appeared in the sky, but they appeared to come from some distance beyond the silent ship. Half an hour later, more rockets were seen by the Californian. Again, she tried to make contact with the other ship by Morse lamp, but the stranger moved rapidly off to the southwest. It was 1.15 on the morning of April the 15th. Was there a third ship that night? If, as was the official opinion, the Californian was only five or six miles away, why couldn't she see the blaze of lights from the Titanic's deck and cabin lights on this clear night? And likewise, why didn't the Titanic see the well-lit Californian? Because, say the defenders of the Californian, the ships were some 19 miles apart, not five or six. The following morning, when the Californian learned of the sinking, it took two and a half hours at full speed to reach the reported disaster spot. Even at that rate, if she had acted on seeing the first rocket, she would not have reached the area until 55 minutes after the Titanic sank, about the same time that the shrieks and moans of the dying in the water finally stopped. The Californian would have been too late. But the mystery ship, yes, she was there, according to a remarkable confession by her first officer, and she was the ship seen by both the Californian and the Titanic. That confession was made by Henrik Nes, first officer and harpoon gunner of the Norwegian sail steamer ship, the Samson. According to one report, Nes, conscience-stricken when he put into Iceland after the Titanic disaster, made a statement to the Norwegian consul. He said he was part of an illegal seal hunting expedition and on the night of the 14th and 15th of April had been operating on Newfoundland ice floes. The Samson was within sight of the Titanic and saw her rockets. He thought these big stars were signal rockets from the US Navy closing in on the sealers. Nace said he saw lanterns and lots of lights which suddenly went out. The Samson had no radio so didn't know the Titanic was in trouble. Fearful of arrest, his ship moved quickly away. What might we not have done if we had known, he said. I contacted the archives section of the Royal Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Oslo, asking why this confession was kept secret for so long. The following day, I got this reply. The records of this ministry contain no information relating to the alleged confession made by the first officer of the sealing ship, Samson. But I have typewritten copy of Nace's unpublished autobiography, which repeats his claim. Historians report that Henrik Nace also made a sworn statement shortly before his death in 1962, claiming again that the Samson was the vessel near the Titanic, thereby substantiating Captain Lord's report of a third ship. According to maritime officials in Norway, this statement and the official log of the Samson have somehow disappeared. Among those who support Ness's claim is Dr. John de Courcy Ireland of the Maritime Institute, convinced that the Samson was the ship in question and Captain Lord and the Californian were innocent parties in the whole Titanic story. She was the ship that was seen approaching by, uh, about half an hour after the ship hit the iceberg while people were crowding into the lifeboats. She was seen. Previous to that, no ship was seen. So the Californian can't have been all that close. And certainly the ship that was seen approaching cannot have been the Californian, because she was hove to. Despite attempts by Captain Lord's Union, the Mercantile Marine Service Association, and individual members of the British House of Commons to have the inquiry reopened to clear Captain Lord, the British Board of Trade have steadfastly refused. When I contacted them, I was told there was no intention of rehearing the evidence for Captain Lord. Several efforts have been made to clear Captain Lord's name. Uh, his family, of course, the man is long since dead, but even the family tried to uh, reopen the inquiry. I don't know, I suppose somebody had to be a scapegoat. Unfortunately, it was Captain Lord. What would you like to see happen? Oh, I think 
certainly, I, I think it's probably far too late for an inquiry, but uh, I, I would like to, to think that, that the man would be, could be, and should be exonerated. The Merchant Shipping Act of 1894 stated, every formal investigation into a shipping casualty shall be conducted in such a manner that if a charge is made against any person, that person shall have an opportunity of making a defence. This part of the act was ignored by the inquiry. Captain Lord wasn't even officially notified of the allegation, and the inquiry closed without giving him a chance to defend himself. I don't think, and I think the Mercantile Marine uh, Service Association also didn't think that it would be possible for the thing to be reopened without Lord having an extremely strong case. But the case has never been judged, and to condemn a man that will, it might be innocent is against...